Go, go to Matthew chapter 28. We'll read a few verses. And today I'm, I'm going to teach, I believe, just generally about what resurrection and what this day typifies. You never know. We're in a generation where a lot of people may not be as abreast or informed on what this holiday. Y'all know where the word holiday comes from. You ever thought about it? I've taught this before. Spell holiday, H-O-L-I-D-A-Y. It's a derivative of holy day. They dropped the Y and changed it to an I, and then they stole it. <laughs> but that's where it comes from, holy day. Amen. Now, in the New Testament, Christ, and, and, and understanding every day in Christ is a holy day. We're not subject to days. We're in the spirit. We're a new creation in Christ Jesus. Amen. However, we do understand that universally people acknowledge this as what's called uh, Passover, secular term Easter, and of course I call it Resurrection Day. Praise God. So um, uh, open your Bibles to Matthew 28, verse 1. We'll get right into the Word. I'm going to teach you some things and go over some things in prayer for this. It's going to be a blessing to you. Now, after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to draw on, this was actually Sunday. Sunday's the first day of the week. So when Jesus rose from the dead, technically it was on a Sunday. Saturday is the traditional Sabbath of the, of the Old Testament. So Jesus rose on the first day of the week. Somebody say first day of the week. Mary Magdalene and the, and the other Mary came to see the tomb. I, I do a message where I talk about how women are first responders. Man, you have to admit it. I've, I've been pastoring a long time, and usually 90% of the time, God gets the woman first. She responds first, and then she has to work on the husband. Amen. It's just something the way it works. Think about it. When Jesus rose from the dead, who was there first? The women were there first. It's something about women when it comes to spiritual things. Many times, you are first responders. However, God did tell Mary, though, go tell Peter. So where there's a Mary, you also need a Peter. Come on now. Turn to somebody, turn, turn to somebody opposite of you, opposite sex of you. Say, we, God needs us both. He needs us both. He needs all of us. He needs us. Amen. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. He needs us all. <laughs> and the other Mary came to see the tomb, and behold, there was a great earthquake. For an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the doorway and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning and his clothing as white as snow. And the guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. So when they come to the tomb, it's an empty tomb, and Jesus had risen from the dead. Notice the tomb was empty. Somebody say empty. Meaning that they didn't see later a ghost or his spirit. They literally saw Jesus. The man Jesus, they saw him in his physicality. Later on, we'll get to this. Even Thomas, who was doubting Thomas, Jesus said, touch me. Put your hands in my nail-scarred hand. Put your hand in my side. So Jesus, when he rose from the dead, unlike any other person, he rose physically from the dead. It wasn't just his spirit. It wasn't a ghost. It was the man Jesus that had been raised from the dead. That makes him different from any other religion. Even in, his, even in Islamic ministry, uh, 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 religion, they believe that the spirit of Muhammad supposedly ascended to heaven. True or not, and I could talk about that, but, but the, the bottom line is we know it's not, but here's the point I'm going to make. The point I want to make is that Jesus didn't rise from the dead spiritually. He rose from the dead physically. It's like going to a funeral, seeing them bury the man, and then three or four days later showing up at the crib, and he's sitting right there at the living room table. Does that give you a better view? <laughs> That'd freak you out, wouldn't it? Well, that's what happened when they saw Jesus. It freaked them out. And the first thing he said to them, fear not, it is I. <laughs> Fear not, it is I. So what is the primary purpose of this holiday? Um, 
I, I want to give you the pros and cons. I want to give you information so you understand some things. Easter is what they call it secularly, but me particularly, you notice, I always endeavor to call it Resurrection Day. Easter, in its true meaning, does not mean Easter eggs. It doesn't represent Easter bunnies and those kind of things. Let me explain to you where those things derive from so you have an understanding. Easter eggs, one of the most recognizable symbols associated with Easter is the Easter egg itself. The symbols go back to the ancient Babylonians. They believed in their ancient religion that an egg fell from heaven into the Euphrates rivers and hatched, and it hatched the goddess of fertility known as Easter. Oh, it's quiet in here. So the pagans, what they did, they exchanged eggs as gifts during their springtime festival. So the, the ideology or the, or the ritual of this started many, many years way even before Christ, before he was on earth. This is an ancient uh, traditional ritual way back even during the time of the Babylonians. Easter, the term Easter, is short for the name Ashtar. Ashtar is the goddess of fertility. The Easter bunny, another popular Easter symbol, is the Easter bunny uh, likened to eggs. Rabbits represent the spring season and fertility. The Easter rabbit tradition originated in the pagan uh, festival of Easter or oyster, represented by a northern goddess who was associated with the rabbit and the hare. So just like any other cultures, many times um, there tends to be a mixture for example, when they first brought the early Africans to America and they became saved, many of the Europeans would associate their, uh, uh, their ritual as being a mixture. But simultaneously, the Europeans would also mix in the pagan rituals of Easter. So we must understand that the greater meaning or the true meaning is simply about Jesus. Now, let me explain why they did it, though just to be fair. In the very beginning, when many of the European uh, countries, we know them as Europeans, they weren't European at that time, came to Christ in the early church, they created clever ways. They were trying to create clever ways to portray Christ and the resurrection within their pagan system. So what they would do, for example, the, the, the idea was the Easter egg was boiled. And the reason why they would boil it, boil it is that when the egg was removed, the empty shell was supposed to represent the empty tomb. So they were trying to associate as, as an evangelistic tool to teach a rather paganistic society about Christ. Amen. That was at the very beginning. But how many of you know that we've, as believers in this day and age, we've moved beyond that revelation? Even in some societies, they had to use clever ways to evangelize the people because of the persecution of the governments and of the kings of those days. So they would use undercover, clever ways to try to portray Christ. But the problem comes, and please get this, is that many times through the association of this, uh, we get further and further away from what's called authentic faith. The Bible says in Romans chapter 5, we are justified by faith. Watch this. Any time, in any way, that you begin to impose rituals, symbols, embols, embol, all these different things, you're slowly getting away from faith. You begin to make it about exterior things. And then after a while, it becomes superstition instead of faith. But the Holy Spirit, you notice, is not drawn to Easter bunnies. He's not drawn to relics or rituals. The Holy Spirit is drawn to faith in Christ and faith alone. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I've been doing this all my life. Well, you know, God is a merciful God, and God will meet you where you are, but too much is given, much is required. And as we begin to understand and grow in knowledge of Christ, the Bible says we begin to lay aside childish things. 